1 Corinthians 13, Paul's great passage on love. It's often read at weddings. And to, today, it's Trish and Simon's wedding anniversary. Number six, I think, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, may God bless you, especially this day. 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> Now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames that have not love, I am nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am known. Now there remain three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Let's pray. Pray, Lord, that you would speak to us afresh through this familiar passage. That uh, you would reveal more and more of your great love to us. Amen. What a tremendous piece of biblical poetry that is. You've probably heard many sermons on this passage, most probably at weddings. Um, it's very popular, as Jerry said, at weddings. You might have had it at your wedding. It has great rhythm, fine sentiments, and it's not religious. It doesn't mention God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit or church. And I have a wonderful wedding sermon in my file that I could have recycled today. But as many of you well know, the context of this passage, 1 Corinthians 13, has little to do with weddings and a lot to do with church life. And the link is in this context to chapter 12. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And then it goes on to chapter 13. And the wider context of this passage is the misapplication of spiritual gifts and the subsequent competition and division caused. Love, as outlined in this chapter, is not an alternative to spiritual gifts, but the way of love is the more excellent way of discovering and using spiritual gifts. The unhealthy way is using the gifts out of a desire to be the biggest cheese in the church 
and to run the most successful ministry, if not bigger than all the churches in the country, bigger than than at least the church down the road. And it's not that the Charismatics and the Pentecostals have the gifts, and the Evangelicals the Bible, and the Liberals the love. It's about God's Use it it's about God's precious gifts used with God's amazing love according to God's principles expressed in his words. It's about how we use the spirit the spiritual gifts according to his principles in love. And it's important to point out at the outset the meaning of the Greek words translated love in this passage. There's a saying, isn't there, that the Greeks have a word for it. And here the Greek word in this passage is agape. It's not eros, romantic love. It's not philio, brotherly love. It's not storge, family love, but agape. It's the word used in the New Testament for never-ending, self-giving love. Love lavished on others, whether they deserve it or not. Specifically, it's a love that comes from God and is displayed in the life and death of Jesus Christ. It's the kind of self-giving love that Jesus demonstrated when he died on the cross for each one of us. Paul says elsewhere, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for each one of us when we were still sinners and demonstrated his love for us in this. And this agape love should be the hallmark of the Christian community and Christian relationships. It's the kind of love we should aspire to as Christians. But then Paul talks about the lack of love in verse 1 to 3. He says, without love, I am nothing. Gongs and symbols were regularly used by the followers of the Greek mystery religions in Corinth. They worshipped Dionysus, the god of nature, and Sibylle, the goddess of wild animals. And their worship included wild sexual orgies. And they made a right racket as they played their gongs and their cymbals, and they annoyed the neighborhood. Paul says that the use of the gift of tongues without love, without the consideration for others, is nothing more than an annoying noise. People who use the spiritual gifts of prophecy, revelation, wisdom, and knowledge without love are nothing. He says, if I have the gift of faith which can move mountains but have not love, I am Nothing. And today, as in the Corinthian church, some spiritually gifted individuals and ministries are admired as successful and important, but Paul says without love, they are not just unimportant, they are nothing. Some Christians can use the gift of tongues and other spiritual gifts insensitively. Not to build up the church, but to attempt to make themselves look good or to gain attention. Typically, they crash that moment of awe and worship when the congregation is focused on God and they come in with a tongue or a prophecy and they draw attention to themselves away from God. And you can sense that. I'm sure you've been in meetings where someone's done that and you think, oh no, they've just done that in the wrong place. They're drawing attention to themselves. It jars, but like a bum note on the piano. See, generally, I want people to use spiritual gifts. I want to encourage you to use spiritual gifts, but just for a few, I want you to think about your motives before you speak. Am I doing this to build up the body of Christ? Am I doing this to look good? Then he says, without love, I gain nothing. In verse 3, Paul refers to practical acts of self-sacrifice that most of us would regard as extreme discipleship that would put us in the Premier League of Christian disciples. You know, somewhere up there among the saints and the apostles. 
giving away all our possessions to the poor, surrendering to martyrdom. Surely, we say, such things are highly valued by God. Surely such things accomplish much for the kingdom of God. If someone gave away all their possessions or offered themselves up to be put to death for the cause of Christ, surely God admires those things. But Paul says no. Even such acts as these without love can be motivated by self-interest to look good in the eyes of others. Or they can be dead works and attempt to work our own righteousness in the eyes of God to build up spiritual credit, if you like, in our spiritual bank account with God. Without love, such acts, though outwardly impressive, gain nothing. But then he says, love is, verse 4. The well-known 1980s theologian and mystic Howard Jones famously asked the question, what is love? And it's important for us Christians to answer that it's because it's fundamental to our faith and practice. And since the 1970s, there's been a comic strip called Love Is. There you go. Um, possibly inspired by this passage and itself inspiring a whole industry of cards and student posters. Anybody have a Love Is poster on their wall when they were a student? Oh, <laughs> it worked too, yeah. Anybody still got a Love Is poster on their wall? Uh, sorry? Got a tea towel, yeah. Um, but a far more pertinent definition of love is given by Paul in verses 4 to 7, in both the positive and the negative. He says, love is patient and kind. Patience and kindness are examples of fruit of the Spirit, given by Paul in Galatians 5. As we cooperate with God, the Holy Spirit will work in our lives to create the loving character of Jesus. And love is not envious, boastful, proud, dishonorable, or self-seeking. Paul looks at the sins that were prevalent in the Corinthian church. People were jealous of each other's success. They were envious of others' gifts. They were proud of their own giftings and knowledge. And they were pushing for honor and position. Jesus, by contrast, humbled himself and made himself of no reputation, the Bible says. In submission to the will of his Father and for the love of sinful mankind, he surrendered himself to crucifixion upon the cross for our sake. He gave up everything that heaven affords that we might gain eternal life. This is love vast as the ocean. This is love that Jesus gave up heaven for us. He came and suffered for us, for our sake, humbled himself even to death upon the cross, the means of execution for the lowest of the low, that we might become friends and children of God. And love is not easily angered. Love is not unforgiving or delighted in evil. Paul looks at three ways in which we react that shows a lack of love. We can anger easily. We can become touchy or grumpy. We can even blame, we can easily blame this on the failings of others. Oh, what a stupid driver. Why are you driving at 45 miles an hour when the speed limit is 60? I found myself saying the other day. We can cling on to unforgiveness and bitterness, even when it hurts only us or the ones we love. By contrast, Jesus, when crucified, said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. We can rejoice in evil. Simply the perversity of enjoying sin, which is rebellion against God, or rejoicing in the failings of others. Germans have a word for it, don't they? Schadenfreude, damaged joy. It means uh, 
literally. We Brits don't have a word for it, but we kid ourselves that we don't feel it sometimes. We do feel it sometimes, don't we? The atheist Gore Vidal said, whenever a friend succeeds, a little something in me dies. Somehow the failings of others make us look relatively good. And gossip is a form of this, this sin. You know, oh, haven't you heard this about this person? Somehow it makes us look relatively better than them, we think. But love always, Paul says in verse 7, love in contrast always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Who here can say that in all things they always protect, trust, hope, and persevere? Come on. Sometimes we just give up, don't we? We give up believing God is going to do something in a situation and we stop praying. Or we just find the situation too difficult and we pack in trying. Or we just lose interest. Mae West, in her well-known commentary on this passage, said, Love conquers all things except poverty and toothache. There's more than a grain of truth in Miss West's observation. It's poverty and toothache which often does for love. And by that I mean the ordinary stuff of life. We're called to practice love in the small acts of obedience and kindness in our daily lives, aren't we? Doing the washing up, putting the bins out, saying we're sorry again, forgiving the small failings again, covering for the sick work colleague again. Whatever it is, the small act of kindness, we're called to continue to do that act of love. And sometimes we're asked by God to persevere through the really trying situations of life that require real, consistent love. Bittlinger said, love sacrifices the right to rebel against God. And this passage is very challenging teaching for Christians, isn't it? It's nice for weddings, but it's very challenging teaching for Christians. It's on a par, I think, with the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. And to the point where some say Paul is using hyperbole. I think it's only with God's help that we can keep on loving with this kind of agape love. And that brings us to the final section of this chapter. The part that talks about endless love. Love never fails. The Greek word is piptai, which means falls or collapses, rather like a bridge under extreme load. Love never collapses. Agape love never folds under extreme and sustained pressure. It continues through death and on to eternity. And that shows us that the source of agape love cannot be human and can only come from God. Since even with supreme human effort, our love is limited. It says in Lamentations 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. Because we serve a faithful God, his love never fails. Paul then refers to the three spiritual gifts that the Corinthian church values most. They happen to value tongues, knowledge, and prophecy. And he says they will be, become irrelevant or surpassed when perfection comes. And I take that to mean when Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom upon earth. The time of maturity will overtake the time of childish things. Paul says, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. 
Mirrors in his day were made with polished metal. They weren't made with silvered glass like nowadays, and, so, and thus the reflection in mirrors of his day were a bit dim and scratchy. And likewise, the spiritual gifts of revelation only provide a imperfect image of God. Whereas one day such revelation will be unnecessary as we will see Jesus face to face. As John says, dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. As Christians, we know Jesus only in part. And until he returns, we shall not know him fully. But the vital thing for us to grasp is that truth of verse 12, that we are fully known by God. He knows everything about us. And despite knowing everything about us, he knows all our fears and failures. God loves us and accepts us as his precious children, just as we are. Paul says elsewhere in Romans 5, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Ask God this morning to reveal his great love for you and to fill you with his Holy Spirit that you may love him and love others in turn with the love of God. Paul ends with this famous verse. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love supersedes all the gifts because it outlasts them all and by its nature reflects the nature of God. John says God is love. This great passage doesn't mention God. But it's all about the love of God who is love. And it has shown us this love in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are love. And have shown us this love in Christ. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit that we might know afresh the power and reality of your love in our lives. And give us the strength, Lord, to love others as you have loved us. Amen.